being single and childless isn't a choice. I was born like this. It's just the natural, <laughs> you know? Who am I to argue with, you know? Uh, it's gonna be here, I live in LA. It's just like Utah. Um, it's just, it's the same. We have snow too, it's a different snow. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, it's terrible, but um, it's good. I, I've been doing comedy there for about 17 years. I get recognized more from driving Uber and substitute teaching than I do from performing, so that's nice. Hey, I know you, man. Oh yeah, from one of the shows I've been on? No, 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 you drove me 4th of July to the beach. It was wonderful. Uh, there was traffic, but you had good music on. Five stars, man, so uh, thanks, all right. Makes me feel good. Ah, oh, God, LA's funny, California, you know, you live in California, people, you travel, people say, oh, aren't you afraid of the sharks? What do you do about the sharks? I stay out of the water, you know, that usually does it. Um, the way it works, they don't come get you, you know, they don't. They don't lure you in either, they're like, come on in, the water feels great, you know. No, I, I just ate, you know, I have to wait a half hour. My mom's gonna get upset, so. Sharks don't wait after eating. They don't, they don't sit and wait for 30 minutes. They just go right on and swim. That's why they have terrible relationships with their moms. Um, what's he talking about? So, uh, so it's good. Good you're out. It's, you know, it's a nice evening. There's some couples here. That's nice. Nothing more romantic than watching a stranger speak for an hour and not having to talk to each other. That's very, uh, that's very beautiful. Um, I, uh, I'm not married. Uh, I'm, I'm 44. I've never been married, never been engaged, don't have any kids but I'm just as exhausted as fathers who've done that. Like, I'm all caught up with you. So I, I'm here, I'm out of money, I'm out of energy. I don't know if I'm gonna have any more kids. So I feel like one of you. I'm at the age, I'm at least supposed to be divorced by now, right? I'm at least supposed to have, right? have one under my belt, you know, just, just to show. People get weirded out, people get weirded out, you tell them, so I have to lie to make them feel better. I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm divorced with like four kids or something. And I'm like, oh, that's much better, you know. <laughs> oh, we thought something was wrong with you. <laughs> now you can join our support group. Come on in, it's like, oh, okay, what's going on, so. Uh, being single and childless isn't a choice. I was born like this. It's just the natural, <laughs> you know, who am I to argue with, you know. <laughs> just so natural, man, so natural. Uh, my mom wants me to get married. A lot of parents want their kids to get married and have kids. Grandkids are cute, but they want to see us suffer like we made them suffer, right? <laughs> that's really, that's really what... Your father and I did not work hard and sacrifice, young man, so you could just date different women and enjoy your life. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're gonna get married, have kids. Mom, what if I don't love her? Love has nothing to do with it. Your father and I stopped loving each other years ago. We're much happier now, so. <laughs> so ooh, that sounds good. Oh, man. So it's good. I, I, you know, I start dating someone. My mom wants to get married and have kids right away. She's like, come on, that girl doesn't put out. Come on, you gotta seal the deal with one of her friends. I'm like, mother, what is going on here? You know, this is ridiculous. So do you guys have moms? <laughs> of you, one or two, orphans in the middle. All right, nice. <laughs> So I tell girls that on a first date, I was like, we gotta get married right away and have kids. They're like, why? I'm like, my mom said, you know, here's a note. <laughs> so <laughs> we gotta do it. We gotta do it. It's nice. I, uh, so I travel, I pocket call my mom the other day. You know, your phone dials from inside your pocket. You don't know it. Uh, she's like, hey, did you mean to call me? And I said, no, I pocket called you. And she said, oh, well, your pocket's a better son than you are. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my God, that's brutal. So. Ah, so it's good, you know, you're working on that relationship for life. At this point, I think she'd be happy if I were just gay. You know, she's like, give me something to work with over here. I need something to tell my friends, right? So I bring home other straight guys. I'm like, this is my lover, you know? And she gets excited, wants us to get married, works to legalize gay marriage. The day of the wedding comes, right? We have to come out of the closet to say we're straight. She freaks out. Our friends are like, I knew you straights, look at those clothes. You know, I was like, oh, this is all right. Doing my best, you know? My dad's like, oh, I dropped 30 grand on a wedding I'm never gonna see. I'm like, dad, I thought the bride's family paid for that. He's like, we thought you were the bride. Knock <laughs> us out here. Oh, God. So ridiculous. 
I do a Big Brother thing in Los Angeles. I don't know if that's big uh, in other areas. I think it's all over the world, right? They have Big Brother programs. My little guy's great. He's 65. And <laughs> he takes me to movies and ball games, and he just lets me stay out as late as I want. It's really so much easier than I thought it would be going into the thing. So, um, so it's nice. I, uh, I enjoy it. So thank you, women and mothers. If you're a, mother, if you're a mom out there, thank you. It's funny that... that that men avoid relationships more than women when women do the brunt of it, right? They have the kids, they communicate, they, they keep the relationship fresh, you know? And, but in the long run, I think kids cling to their moms more than their dads. I think in times of trouble, we go to our mother, you know? Uh, there's no such expression as wait till your mother gets home, you know? <laughs> kids would be like, cool, when's that gonna be? Is that soon? Uh, somebody who's gonna listen, who I can reason with, who's not gonna swear and throw furniture? That's great, she is coming though, right? She's coming? more connected over the course of our lives. Naturally, we're more connected to our moms. We're more connected to the person who shoots 100% of us out of them in pain than we are the person who shoots out 50% in pleasure. You know what I'm <laughs> Right down the line with that one. Right down the line. Uh, some of these, I know as I'm saying them, I'm like, oh boy, uh, this could get quiet quick. Because because moms, you can ha hold that over us our whole lives, right? Oh, you don't want to run to the store for me? Because I remember being in labor for 30 hours so you could be here. Okay. You know. But dads can never be like, you know, son, it took me two and a half minutes of joy to make you. you know? <laughs> little gratitude would be nice. A little bit. Okay. I almost had to take my socks off, so... All right, little pockets here and there. Interesting, interesting. All right, different tastes, okay. Eventually, we'll all laugh at the same joke for now. Breaking it off by section and very organized. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. I have siblings with kids. I'm an uncle, um, obviously. Um, I'm a stay-at-home uncle. I like to do that part. You know, you just, uh, God, they grow up so fast when you only see them once a year, you know? <laughs> if you're an aunt or an uncle, I tell you, and you're watching those kids, you gotta keep your eye on them every single couple of hours. You really, you know, you guys, you look good. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, but I love it, I love it. It's like being a grandparent, but you didn't have to go through the work of being a parent. You can come and go as you please. Uh, there was a birthday party for my niece. I went to a pizza place. She had to go to the bathroom, and all the adults were busy, so I had to take my six-year-old niece at the time to the bathroom. And I've never taken a little girl to the restroom before, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> and I didn't know. Just a total, uh, you know, a, a single idiot mindset of like, I have no idea. I know somebody's got to cross the streams here. Somebody's got to go in the wrong one. I was like... Ooh. Grown women don't want to go into a men's room, so a little girl can't go in, which is exactly what I was supposed to do. Uh, and I'm like, honey, what, do you go into the men's or the woman's? And she says, who knows anymore, you know? And I was like... How smart is this girl? Oh my God, adopted, right? Um, so like a dope, I take her into the uh, woman's. I take her into the woman's restroom thinking I'm fine, right? And women, you're already good at communicating when you're not angry. Um, and then you throw anger in there and oh boy, that comes out quick. And women are like, what are you doing? You know? And I'm like, what's your problem? I've got the pass right here, right? Anyway, um, we got kicked out and my niece says, oh, men aren't allowed in the women's restroom? And I was like, no, no. And she said, can women go into the men's? And I was like, you know, we don't mind. It's the darndest thing. <laughs> right, fellas? We're just more open-minded, I guess. Um, so, something to learn from. Something to learn from, ladies. <laughs> All right, good. Um, making friends and enemies here uh, within just a few moments. It's really quite nice. Uh, it's good. I don't, you know, kid, I miss being a kid, right? Being a child is fun. I miss thinking the girls are gross. Guys, how much money could we save if we still thought girls were gross? <laughs> right? Hey, stranger, buy me a drink. Oh, sorry, ma'am. You're gross. Okay. <laughs> you give me the willies. Uh, 
STDs are one thing, but cooties, no way. That, I'm not going with cooties, man. That's some scary stuff, so. I do like growing up. I, I like the wisdom that comes with age. You know, you learn to pick your battles. I used to look at beautiful women and think, wow, I'd really like to marry her. Now I see a beautiful woman and all I think is, oh, her boyfriend must have to put up with a lot. <laughs> you know, that looks, that looks painful. All that shopping and talking and listening and expensive pets. Oof. It's easier just to be lonely, right? <laughs> He's looking at me by myself, walking down the street. He looks so happy. How does he do it? Teach me, teach me. Oh, but uh, it's nice, you know. I, I, was, I got to make out with a girl once who was so beautiful, I could hardly believe she'd agreed to it. And uh, I was so nervous, I kept having to check in with her every few moments. I'm like, you're still good with this, right? Because uh, if I don't get you to sign off on everything, I'm in some pretty big trouble here, right? And part of me wanted to get married with her right there and have a kid just to, you know, prove that we were ever together. And my friends would be like, no way did you marry and have a kid with that girl. And I'd, see, I'd say, what? Look at, look at this half-cute baby. I mean, come on. <laughs> Look at the teeth on that kid. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, that's big teeth, guys. That's, uh, I'll, I'll explain some of these as I go. Um, I have big teeth. Uh, I have a big head and face around it, which is nice. You don't want one without the other. Then people are like, oh, he's got a small face. No, it's big teeth, small face. With the, with the combo, I'm able to eliminate that debate and bring world peace, uh, which is... Which is nice. So I do have a big head. I always have to wear collared shirts. Otherwise, I look like the lowercase letter I. So, yeah, it's good. So, uh, yeah, so the beautiful girl, we were together for a little bit. And uh, we went to the movies once. And uh, the guy's like, hey, man, sorry, we're sold out. Beauty and the Beast. And I was like, oh, excuse me. All right, we weren't, we're not here to see that. Shrek. Um, so it was a good time. Uh, I, but I don't know, maybe someday I'll do the marriage, I think. You know, plenty of time, right? <laughs> 44? Okay. Um, we'll see, you know. It's, it's funny. Women, women often, it's funny, women often complain. That's it. Yeah, there's no second half to that. Um, only half of you? Only half of you. Oh, really? Now I gotta find the other half. I will say that women are very resourceful. You're allowed to stalk us. We can't stalk you, okay? We call the cops on you, they're like, get over it, <laughs> right? We have a lot of other bigger problems to deal with. Uh, you know, the day after Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he got a call from some woman he was trying to avoid. He's like, how'd you get this number? I just invented this thing yesterday. <laughs> There's not even a second phone. What are you, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm reinventing telecommunications, what are you? What are you wearing? Yeah, I'm coming. Okay, very good. Um, just text me the address. Text me, it's the 1880s. Uh, guys, we wouldn't even know if it's stalking until it's too late, right? The woman's got the gun pointed at us. We're like, oh, I should have looked into this. You know? <laughs> but that's how you solve the gun problem, I think, is just arm the women. That's it. Just arm the women, because rarely are they gonna shoot you. They're gonna explain to you why they're doing it. <laughs> You think you can learn now? You think you can put that into practice? Okay, there's no bullets in this. I just matched the purse. I just bought it, so that's fine. Uh, it's nice. Uh, some people would rather be in a bad relationship than no relationship. We know some of those people, which is a shame, right? That's like being out of groceries, and instead of going to the store, you eat the rat poison because it's the only thing left in the kitchen. It's like, go to the store, shop, get some more food. Oh, no, I'll just eat this. But you'll die, but I'll be thinner. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Oh, God. So... Oh man, I keep saying that, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say it. I'm used to doing clean comedy, but Provo Clean is a different thing, so if I keep saying that, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the altitude, it's, it's affecting me. Uh, you can hit me on the shoulder afterwards for every time I say it, so uh, stick with me. Um, so it's good, I love it, I travel. Uh, I, you know, I, lived, I went to Japan for a couple years, it was a good time, because my grandpa always said, you wanna be a man, you gotta go fight the Japanese. And I was like, okay. <laughs> What? Like, so I went over there to fight, and uh, I missed the war by 50 years, you guys. I was half a century off, so that was a little tricky. But I stayed over there, and I dated a Japanese girl while I was there, and, and the program ended, so I came home, and my friends found out, and they said, oh, you had a Japanese girlfriend, now you have an Asian fetish. And I was like, no, I have a woman fetish. <laughs> and I was living in Asia. <laughs> Two and two be foe. <laughs> That's all it is. Right? We adjust to our surroundings. Castaways don't have coconut fetishes. 
You put a white supremacist in Harlem, in a week he'll be singing, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> Armies shouldn't guard our borders. It should be our most beautiful women. And then when the other army shows up to fight, it's like, whoa, what do we have here? All right, guns down, let's go back to my place. This war is over. <laughs> So I got back from Japan, all my friends are asking me, hey, what's China like? I'm like, well, it's a different country. Um, you can't really compare the two. It's like comparing apples and orange chicken. Um, we're in debt to China. We owe a lot of money to China. I don't really mind. I've been in debt to America my whole life. Let's give somebody else a chance, right? Because we're not gonna be able to understand the collection notices once those come in the mail, right? This is a bill or a menu for that new dim sum place. Now, this looks delicious. Look at all this red ink. Must be spicy. Okay. It's going to get to the point. Someday we're going to open a fortune cookie and it's just going to say, pay up, man. <laughs> Doesn't sound like Confucius. <laughs> What's going on here? We're a little paranoid about other people coming in uh, to the country. You know, we're already a very international country community all over, right? There's not one type of food you can't get here in town. We're already very international. July 4th, America's birthday, our greatest day. Right? It's ob America's obviously male. If we were a female, we'd have to celebrate from the 4th through the 11th the whole week. Um, very good, all right. <laughs> and what do we do? We let off fireworks. Do we get these fireworks from America? No, we have to go to Mexico. <laughs> to buy fireworks from China so we can celebrate independence from England while we drink Budweiser, now owned by Belgium. So, Yankee Noodle Dandy, we're all in this together. You know what I'm saying? Uh. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to learn a, another language, so I, uh, I went to Ireland. Okay, my friend married a, a girl from there, a beautiful Irish girl, and we were there. And the day before the wedding, uh, we were walking through the streets of Dublin, and this woman had her purse stolen. Little white guy, little white legs, he just ran off. And uh, I, I, was looking, I was watching him, and I had time to think about, I was like, I could catch him. I had time to think about catching him. Um, I'm white, I've never caught anybody in my life, you know. And, uh, and so I run after him, and I get him. All of a sudden, I'm right next to him. I'm like, oh, that was quick. And I get the purse back for the woman, and she's so appreciative. She comes up, she hugs me, her passport's in there, a bunch of cash. And she runs off. And something I hadn't noticed was he had little guys with him, little buddies that were kind of blocking us off as we were chasing. I didn't even notice. I thought they were chasing him too. I was wondering why they were so slow. Um, and they all surrounded me. They were the same height. They were surrounded me. And I'm like, oh my God, did I land on a witch? Like what happened? <laughs> and one of them looks at me and he's like, if you ever do that again, we'll kill you. And I was like, oh my God, that accent is so adorable, you know? <laughs> It is so cute. Let's, you know, we took a picture together and uh, we don't do that enough in this country. Take pictures with the people who just robbed us, right? We need to do that more. I was on the news that night. Crime in Ireland cut 50%. I'm like, oh my God, all the, all the crime in America, the one time I stop it, I'm in the safest country in the world. But it is a beautiful accent. If you know anybody from Ireland or if you've been there, it's just lyrical the way they speak. And we try to do the accent, but it never, it always turns into a Jamaican accent whenever America. <laughs> Hey, Patrick, top of the morning to you, man. Happy St. Patrick's Day. What? <laughs> Aaron go bra, man. Yeah, I know it's a shamrock, but we smoke it anyway, man. <laughs> That's Jamaica, not Ireland. Jamaica is Ireland, man. It's Southwest Ireland. <laughs> you gotta look at a map, man. You gotta look at a map. We smoked the map, man. We smoked it. It was the only paper we had left. Okay, pal. <laughs> We don't get our accents right, I don't think, because we don't go overseas that much, right? We go state to state for our vacations. We don't go overseas. Uh, every state now is like its own country. And a lot more Americans are moving south, Arizona, Texas, Florida, California. I don't know if Americans are moving south for the weather or it's because as a country, we've gotten so overweight, we're actually sliding down the planet, guys. Right? Just clinging to Texas as we have a few more nachos down into Mexico, hopping off at the Panama Canal, all the way, eventually we're hanging off the bottom of the South Pole. Penguins are running for their lives. I've seen what they do to turkeys. Go, go. <laughs> Morgan Freeman's narrating, you know? <laughs> oh. I can joke about chubby people because my dad is white. <sighs> so it's all right, it's all right. 
My dad is, uh, I'm mixed race, actually. My dad is white from uh, Michigan, and my mom is white from Ohio. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice mix. Nice border joke. Some of you got that. Okay, very good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. But I, I've never gotten past food. I, you know, um, drugs and alcohol aren't really necessary, you know, when there's Taco Bell. <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry. It's just, it's like, no, the heroin, I'm going to get a Mexican pizza. You know, this looks good. Uh, People are drinking Red Bull vodka? I don't, is that correct? They mix energy drinks with vodka? Two chemicals working full speed in the opposite direction? If you like to watch John Mayer open for Metallica, Red Bull vodka is for you, I guess. <laughs> Keeping people aggressively drunk for 27 straight hours at a time. That sounds like fun. Uh, I went to college not far from here in Helena, Montana. I don't know if we have any, yeah, nobody. Okay, there weren't anybody there either. All right, <laughs> nice. Uh, it's just up the 15. You got that exit up the 15. You got that exit too, but I'd take that one. If you're going to Helena from here tonight, go out that exit. You don't want to walk all the way around. Um, but it's a beautiful, I, I love it. We had, I like the summers better than the winters for some reason, but we had uh, a lot of barbed wire tattoos on the arm. In Mon Montana's a lot of, Barbed wire tattoo. It comes in handy if you have trouble with cattle crossing from your shoulder to your elbow. <laughs> that barbed wire tattoo keeps everybody's property straight, right? <laughs> Cows see that, they're like, I'm not going near that, you know? <laughs> Put my ribs on it last time, so. I got a tattoo of some wire cutters on this arm. I'm like, I'm gonna get you, you know? I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get your lifestyle. A lot of avalanches, we have avalanches in Montana. Only white people die in avalanches, I don't get that. Uh, every other race has figured out how to stay out of the way of snow when it's coming down a mountain. <laughs> Which is funny because we've been around snow the longest. <laughs> you know, you'd think we'd have figured it out. That's why it's so hard to find any of us. It's like we're the same color. So it's like, I don't know, man, where are they? So. Ah, it was a Catholic college. I was raised, uh, I was raised Irish Catholic. I'm not practicing Irish anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, we played a lot of sports. We used to pray. We used to pray. I don't know how you guys are, but we used to pray to God before grade school football games that we'd win, and we were playing other Catholic grade schools who were praying to this exact same God. I don't think God cares if St. Catherine's Elementary beats St. Margaret's Elementary, right? And if so, who are the public school kids praying to? Because they were kicking the crap out of us. <laughs> Their God was a bad dude. I'm doing the sign of the cross while Marcus Jenkins is dragging me across the goal line for the fourth time in the first half on his way to a Division I scholarship after he'd sign a bonus and I'm, he's making more money in one year than I am doing 17 years of stand-up comedy throughout the United States of America. So, But if you follow sports, you know that there's a lot more white coaches than black coaches, even though a lot more professional athletes are black than white, and it's finally changing, finally improving. And people always said it's racism, it's prejudice, that's why there's so many more white coaches for so long as opposed to black coaches. And it's not racism or prejudice. The reason for so many more white coaches for so long is because growing up as a white athlete, we spend a lot more time on the sidelines than black athletes. <laughs> So that by the time we retire, it's like, oh yeah, I've seen the game from this perspective. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm looking at. Yeah, he's gonna come around, he comes under, I've been over here my whole life. Oh, yeah. Look at my footprints from childhood. <laughs> you know? uh, age five, seven, nine, 11, 13. Uh, I've never even been on that side. What's it like over there? Oh, my ankle. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh okay, my ankle. <laughs> white coaches know how to win with less black coaches sometimes have expectations that are too high right those who can't teach those who can can't teach michael jordan could never coach basketball he'd be like come on guys why is nobody dunking from the free throw line all right <laughs> these are fundamentals we talk about this every day in practice just jump over all five guys every time <laughs> Jump up there, stay up there. You know, there's nothing going on down here. Win six championships in eight years, play a second professional sport, get your own shoe and clothing line, star in a movie with Bugs Bunny. Come on. It's a pyramid of success. I don't get it with you guys, right? 
I ran track one year in high school. I played sports, I ran track one year, and uh, I was gonna finish ahead of a black guy in track once. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna do it. And someone's like, no man, he already finished. He's just doing a cool down. <laughs> like, So I grew up in the suburbs. A lot of suburban fathers want their sons to be professional athletes at all costs. And my family was football. What, what sport, what's the biggest sport here? Football or basketball? Football. football and basketball. All right, we'll go with that. Good job, everybody. Um, <laughs> two people, all right. Suburban fathers want their sons, you know these parents, so they want their sons to be professionals at all costs, but they, they don't marry the right woman, you know? And my dad did his part. He was a big guy, he was athletic, but if you want a son in the big leagues, you need to marry a big farm girl, right? <laughs> or a tough inner city girl, or a big, tough South Pacific Island woman. <laughs> when you marry a sweet little Irish girl who likes musicals. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi. Your son might turn out to be a stand-up comedian, so that's what it is. <laughs> but my mom was in the arts. She wanted us playing sports, too. She was worried about us being nerds. Uh, she was in an organization called MAD, which is Mothers Against Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I went to Kansas City, which is good. Anybody been to Kansas City? It's a very fun town, very good food, very good music. And I wanted to go to this museum, a baseball museum. It's called the Negro Baseball Museum. It's very quiet in here right now. Uh, and I wanted to go, and I was working with a black comedian, and I wanted to invite him, but I didn't know how to word the invite. Right? I don't know who's cool with what words. So I was like, hey man, do you want to go to the baseball museum here in town? And he's like, what, what baseball? I was like, oh, there's a baseball museum. You, you, might, uh, you might love it. Um, <laughs> he's like, oh, the Hall of Fame? And I said, no, that's, that's in New York. This is more of a, and he said, oh, the Negro Baseball Museum. I said, yeah, that's it. You said it, you said it. I, I just, <laughs> I didn't say. And he said, man, you can say the word Negro. It's in the title of the establishment, <laughs> you know? It's on the wall. I said, okay, well, I've seen words on walls before that, uh, you know, I don't. And he said, we gotta end the ignorance. You gotta stop. You gotta be able to have a free exchange of ideas and, you know, it's okay if you're asking questions. It's the maliciousness where you get in trouble. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, do you wanna go to the Negro Baseball Museum? And he's like, no, not with a white guy. So I was like, okay, all right. All right, we'll end the ignorance tomorrow, I guess. Um, but it's good, it's, uh, it's fun. I do love, uh, I love sports, I love, I love playing. I played high school football here in the United States of America. And although you're not necessarily treated like a god, you definitely see yourself as one. And in our locker room, we had banners and signs and slogans everywhere. And one of them, a commonly known one, read, pain is temporary, pride is forever. And now looking back, I can't help but think, yeah, pain is temporary, you know? What a good point. Well, unless of course it comes in the form of an anterior cruciate ligament tear, that you suffer in your left knee after catching a pass going over the middle on third and long to help seal the playoff victory and send your team into the semifinals for the California State Championship, a game you yourself wouldn't be able to play in any other football game ever again for the rest of your life. Pain isn't so temporary when that happens. It tends to stick around a little while. There's not a lot of pride when the season's over and six weeks into the cold, hard winter after football has long faded from the minds of overzealous mothers, fathers, and school administrators who once sang your praises. You're still on crutches relearning how to walk. Nobody's kneeling before you when you're wrapped in a leg brace with a bloody stable infested bandage around your knee that requires you to cut off a pant leg of your overpriced rented tuxedo so that your parental arranged prom date has pictures to show her new boyfriend next year at UCLA. Meanwhile, you're attending the local junior college throbbing in pain every time the temperature drops below 59 degrees. That's the kind of pride we're talking about, thanks, but I'll pass. 
All right, I'll be down the hall in Toronto where the only pain will be watching all those wannabe actors battle it out over the role of Rum Tum Tugger in the school's misadaptation of the hit Broadway musical Cats. <sighs> I'm so cold. <sighs> oh, hey, guys. Um, sorry about that. I, uh... I got my hair cut online. Um, earlier this week, thank you. Yeah, so sorry. I made a mess, I'm sorry. But uh, no, I do, uh, I love sports way too much. It's time, it's time to call it. Um, people think football's so violent, but I think it actually helps um, because a lot of violent people are at home on the couch watching football, <laughs> so. It, I, that's how I justify it in my own head. And because uh, people are like, oh, you know, it's gotten so violent in the country. Like my neighbors fight a lot. Um, there's a lot of crying, broken glass. And uh, the other night it was so bad, it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I was like, oh, I got to do something. I got to get involved. Uh, so the next day I went to the barber and I had him cut the hair on the back of my neck. And I just, I feel so much better uh, about everything. Yeah, so. So yeah, it's just uh, like this whole thing with, that my niece was talking about with like, who knows anymore with the, the sexual gender stuff. And you wonder, it's kind of the, Caitlyn Jenner was kind of the, the, the leader in that. If she's happy, I'm happy. If there were a surgery to become a comedian, I would do it. Um, <laughs> and the whole reason we know who this person is is because what Bruce Jenner did in 1976, the Olympic games, right? Uh, he won the decathlon in Montreal, America's 200th birthday, it was a great time and he wins the decathlon, 10 events, right? And just out of curiosity, I looked at the scores of the, top, of the top women, the top women's scores from those same 10 events, and in five of the 10 events, Bruce Jenner finished ahead of the top women's score, right? My point is, had he not been such a procrastinator, five more gold medals, you guys. Five more gold medals, don't procrastinate in life, okay? Call that person you like, read that book, write that book, take that vacation, otherwise you're leaving gold on the table and the Kardashians will steal it, so. <laughs> and, uh, and I think life's pretty good. This is a pretty nice community. I, it's pretty beautiful up here. You enjoy living up here, guys? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I would hope so. It's pretty fantastic. You know, on the news, they would make you believe that the war is going to end in the next hour. Uh, if you want world peace, turn the TV off, go take a walk. You know, that's what you have to do, right? Because there's great things going on out there. The networks make a lot of money from fear, all of them, you know. I think fear should be a major in college because it makes a lot. Are you pre-law, pre-med? I'm pre-fear. I'm going to go to fear school after this. I'm going to make a lot of money. Because they say the world's gotten so violent. It's got, the world never got violent. There is no God. The world has been violent since the beginning. Cain killed Abel, right? Cain killed Abel. The third person on the planet killed the fourth person on the planet. We weren't even able to make it to three people. Before somebody was a murderer. At one time, a third of the people on the planet were murderers, right? A third of the people in the hood aren't murderers. A third of the people who own guns aren't murderers. A third of the people in jail aren't even murderers. San Quentin, Folsom Prison, and Alcatraz are safer than the book of Genesis. You thought Compton and Baghdad were tough? Try downtown Eden after the sun goes down, right? There was murder and violence at person three. One couple had two boys who had the world to themselves, and one of them was claiming, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. <laughs> Cain killed 25% of the world's population. That's more than Stalin, Hitler, Idi Amin, Pol Pot, King Herod, Genghis Khan, the English, Manifest Destiny, Typhoid, Cancer, AIDS, Cooties, all combined. <laughs> Cain killed a third of the people he knew. He knew three people. He killed one of them. If you knew Cain, you had a 66 and two thirds percent chance of survival. There's no such thing as the good old days. There was no perfect time to be alive. There was like one good day. It was half a day. Adam and Eve were naked, alone, in an oasis. Lunchtime came. People got hungry. 
apples were eaten. <laughs> Boom, Detroit. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Have a great